So I'm Colin. Uh, I'm here with Albert. Uh, we're advised by Kirsta. We're from Berkeley, and we're going to present on uh, Huacha, which is our decoupled uh, data parallel custom extension to Risk Five. So uh, before we dive into any of the details on the microarchitecture or architecture, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the project. Um, so as I said before, this is a custom ISA extension to Risk Five. Uh, it's focused on data parallel applications. Uh, it's conf widely configurable. Uh, and it's an ASIC-focused implementation. Uh, its uh, purpose is to develop a, and research energy-efficient implementations of vector architectures. And uh, there's been set, this isn't the first version of, the, of Huacha. Uh, it was actually started by Yan Zabli, who I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Uh, and this we're presenting on, which is the fourth version uh, we're presenting that today. Uh, so it's a rocket chip-based accelerator. Uh, based, uh, it's got software support for Bing Utils, uh, an LLVM backend, works with the new FireSim stuff from Berkeley, and it's got ASIC VLSI support. And the exciting thing today is that we're, we've already open sourced it today. So we'll have uh, links to all the stuff we're supplying uh, at the end of the talk. But before we can talk about what makes Swatcha different, uh, we need to first go over a few things in traditional vector architectures. Uh, so the main tenet of traditional vectors is this runtime variable uh, vector length register. So what this means is that the programmer can use uh, data in the program to encode exactly, or to change at runtime how many elements each vector instruction operates on. This enables really compact code and it's portable. Uh, it also has this extra property we've written down here as hardware implementation scalability. Uh, and what that means is that when uh, a new device comes out that can operate on more elements at once or longer elements or longer vectors, uh, the same binary code from before will still run on the new implementation and can also see performance gains. Uh, it also is, because we're not encoding uh, how many elements we're operating on inside of the opcode space, we get a, a lot more, a lot less encoding space used up. I have a couple other points that traditional vector machines are noted for usually. Uh, so they're usually more like long vector machines where they're mixing both temporal and spatial execution. Uh, they also traditionally have scalar vector computation to avoid doing any of the redundant work you would see in something, another architecture that might splat data. Uh, and they have a configure register file, which means that they uh, can trade architectural registers for longer element lengths in their vectors. So how does Swatcha differentiate itself from a traditional vector machine? Well, the real goal of this project is to maximize the efficiency of in-order vector microarchitectures. So to that end, we've come up with several ideas here um, to work towards that. Uh, so the first one I have here is the biggest one that affects both the architecture and the microarchitecture, which is access execute decoupling, which is this, this old principle of having part of the machine run ahead, accessing data before you need it for the actual compute, uh, and then having some trailing component that uh, picks up and avoids, uh, it helps, this helps hide memory latency as well as any other latencies in the system. Uh, in addition, we have a pre precision reconfigurable register file. So rather than just trading off how many registers you want, you can also now trade off uh, the width of them and the different types. Uh, in addition, we have uh, predication and consensual branches to enable complex control flow uh, without complex things uh, tracking when uh, threads reconverge. Uh, we also have a little bit more advanced mixed scalar vector computation to further avoid redundant work, as well as mixed precision registers and data paths uh, that enable you to choose the right precision for your operations. And then finally, for programmer support, uh, for ease of use of programming, we have OS, full OS support with uh, unified virtual memory and restartable exceptions. So a quick overview of what's in the ISA itself. Uh, so this is all the state mandated to be added by the architecture. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have the configurable vector data and predicate register files. So these are the ones where you can choose how many you want to use at a time. Uh, and then on the right-hand side of this diagram, we have the uh, fixed numbered address and scalar registers. It's a register register ISA. So we have a full complement of loads and stores, uh, unit shredded, constant shredded, scatter gather, as well as a full set of arithmetic ops on half precision, single precision, and double precision floating point, as well as integers and operations to deal with the predicates. So uh, how does this access execute decoupling affect our programming model? Well, we have what's called a vector fetch programming model, which means that uh, rather than having the vector instructions in line in the control thread, we've pulled them out. So this means that there's going to be a vector fetch instruction in the control thread that sends an address or a PC to the vector unit. 
Uh, at this point, the vector unit then fetches, decodes these instructions, and executes them on its own side. This enables this control processor to kind of access, kind of run ahead as the access processor, uh, and queuing more work and helping to hide memory latency. Okay, so uh, just a quick, just to help hammer home that point, I'm gonna show a quick code example. You don't need to understand all this assembly. Uh, this is implementing the simple uh, Saxby kernel you can see in the bottom left. Uh, just, you know, y equals ax plus y. And then, um, so, there we go. The, the code on the right-hand side is going to execute wholly on the control thread. So this is doing things like setting up the vector unit, uh, sending over constants, doing bookkeeping. A subset of these ops need to be sent to the vector unit for further processing. So, you know, setting, sending the constants, configuring it, and sending that PC that I was talking about before. Uh, this PC points to the block of code on the left-hand side, uh, which is fetched and then executed on the vector unit side. Uh, so before we can talk about how that code example executes on the actual hardware, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of the microarchitecture. So this is kind of a blown up figure from the last slide with the vector unit uh, blown up in more detail. Um, we start with, the, f the first thing that happens after the queue is the scale unit uh, gets the instructions and, or sorry, gets the commands, and it's responsible for also being the front end, so you can see there's a little eye cache in the bottom left here, and so it does the fetching from the memory system for the instructions, decodes them, and then in addition, it's responsible for handling any operations that are purely scalar. So things that don't touch the vector unit at all end up in here where you have the scalar registers and the address registers. After that, anything that needs to be de dealt with by the vector unit gets sent into these sequencers. Uh, so there's this, these are kind of like ROBs in that they track uh, the instructions that are in flight in the machine, their current status, uh, how, many, how many elements they have to go, things like that. And there's uh, one, one master sequencer that's responsible for managing all the machine state, and then each uh, vector lane has its own sequencer uh, handling which, which segment of the instruction is done in each lane. Uh, these lane sequencers are in the vector execution unit, or VXU, which is also where we have the register file slices uh, for the data, vector data registers, the predicate registers, uh, as well as all of our ALUs. In addition, each lane also has a vector memory unit, or VMU, uh, which is responsible for fetching data from uh, the outer memory system. And then finally, we have uh, the vector run ahead unit, or VRU, which is responsible for doing some prefetching uh, based to help with this access execute decoupling. Um, and now Albert's gonna come up and talk about uh, how that Saxby example from before works on this microarchitecture here. So the whole design of Huacha is shaped by the challenge of tolerating long memory latencies uh, with an in-order microarchitecture. So the one advantage of vector processors is that the constant stride vector memory accesses convey an explicit access pattern that is determined exactly once the base address becomes known. So this regularity provides Huacha with the means to implement fairly reliable prefetching, assisted by extensive decoupling in the microarchitecture to initiate memory re references as early as possible. So uh, here, decoupling is basically a, a, an architectural design pattern that allows modules to operate independently and make progress despite unpredictable delays in other parts of the system. So to see how decoupling works, let's uh, step through the Saxby example that Colin introduced earlier. Uh, the code is shown partially enrolled here for clarity. So at the head of the streamline loop, the control processor pushes the configuration and scalar address right to the VXU command queue. Um, at the beginning of each streamline iteration, the vector length update, address register write, and vector fetch commands are pushed to both VRU and VXU queues. Then the VRU immediately begins prefetching instructions and pre-executing vector loads. So it'll refill the L2 cache before the VMU actually accesses the data. Eventually, the VXU and the VMU reach the same iteration as the VRU, and the VMU at this point starts to move data from the L2 cache into the vector register file when the loads eventually resolve. So at this point, hopefully, um, all of the accesses are L2 hits. And because of VXU-VMU decoupling, um, the, movement, the, the data movement can overlap with the VXU computation. So this uh, access SQ decoupling differs from the traditional version because the buffering is provided by the L2 cache instead of dedicated queues. So the scheme with the VRU is, um, comes at a marginal implementation cost. Next, the control processor runs ahead of the vector unit to the next iteration of the strip mine loop. So it'll perform the address computations 
and then push the next vector fetch command to the queues. So at this point, the process begins again. The VRU prefetch the, pre begins prefetching the next iteration while the VXU remains busy with the current one. Now let's delve into a few more details about the microarchitecture. The requirements for a vector length and number of vector registers differ by kernel. So for this reason, the vector register file is reconfigurable to maximize um, resource utilization. So what we mean by that is that there is a vset CFG instruction that allows software to specify the number of vector data and predicate registers. And then the hardware will dynamically remap elements to physical storage. So here's a simplified example of an eight entry vector, physical vector register file. And if we have four vector registers, we can achieve a vector length of two. However, if we use fewer registers, the maximum hardware vector length can automatically extend to fill the available capacity. So here, if we're only using two architectural vector registers, we can double the vector length to four. Now, with mixed precision support, um, not only can we configure the number of architectural registers, we can also specify the individual element widths. Uh, in this case, if register VV1 is only half the precision, we can more densely pack the elements in order to extend the vector length to five. So note that this subware packing and then the subsequent alignment of mixed precision operands during execution are entirely managed by the hardware. Uh, the software is oblivious of the, uh, the mapping of bits to the physical storage. Now the lane is structured around four identical banks, each with a high density one read, run write SRAM based register file, a flip flop based predicate file, a local integer ALU and a predicate logic unit. So the banks are connected by crossbars to the long latency functional units on the right-hand side. Uh, these include two independently scheduled fuse multiply add clusters that provide a total of four double precision FMAs per cycle. There's also a pipeline integer multiplier and some variable latency decoupled functional units such as integer divide and floating point divide with square roots and reductions that are decoupled from the lanes with queues. So the sequencer is the active instruction window in Huacha. It's split into two entities, the master sequencer that contains the common dependency information shared across all of the lanes and other static metadata. Um, each lane also has its own sequencer to track progress within that lane. Execution is managed in groups of eight elements that form a single pass through the lane. And so during every cycle, each lane sequencer checks hazards and selects one ready sequencer operation to send to the expander. So the expander converts this sequencer op into low level control signals called micro ops that drive the lane data path. Uh, to enhance vector instruction level parallelism, element groups from different instructions can issue and complete out of order. So inside the lane, the banks operate in a systolic schedule that enables execution to be fully pipelined. So every micro op performs identical actions at all of the banks, starting at bank zero and advancing one bank per cycle. So for example, operand buffers emulate a multi-ported register file using single read ported SRAMs that is capable of delivering n operands per cycle after an n cycle initial latency. So in cycle one, the R1 micro op reads the first operand in the first operand buffer. So if we move to cycle two, R1 moves to bank one and R, the micro op R2 reads the second operand uh, from the first bank into the other operand buffer. Now in cycle three, both operands are ready to be sent to the function unit at the bottom. Meanwhile, R1 and R2 move to banks two and one, respectively. Um, assuming a single cycle latency for the functional unit, in cycle four, the result is written back to the first bank by the W micro op, and the operands from bank one are sent to the functional unit. And one cycle later, the second result is written back to bank one by the W micro op, and then the process repeats again until all micro ops have cascaded through the banks. Since all hazards have already been cleared by the sequencer, um, this flow of micro ops can proceed without stalling. And elements are st striped across the rec register file to ensure um, that there are no bank conflicts. So the vector memory unit is connected to the L2 cache by a 128-bit Tiling 2 interface. Um, to utilize this bandwidth effectively, um, adjacent elements are coalesced during unit strident memory operations. So there are other optimizations to handle the reordering of responses by the outer memory system. So for ex example, 
um, load data can be written to the register file out of element order as soon as they arrive to minimize the need for buffers. And in addition, multiple vector loads can be overlapped to minimize latency between consecutive operations. So Huacha has been taped out numerous times at Berkeley over the past few years. I think we're counting 10 and up. In our peak power efficiency design, we can achieve 40, more than 40 double precision gigaflops per watt in ST28 nanometer FTSY. Um, here's a chip plot on the right for, that, for one of the more recent chips. In terms of peak floating point, for, floating point performance in 16 nanometers in a 505 chip with eight dual lane watches, we can provide 64 double precision gigaflops or 128 single precision and 256 half precision gigaflops. And we can achieve 95% of peak performance on DGEM. And recently, we observed a 10x acceleration over rocket on a neural net with a single lane. So here's a timeline of all the chips that involve Quacha, starting from 2011 to this year. Uh, the Raven series of chips uh, are from ST28. Um, they were designed to investigate fine-grained DVFS and low-voltage SRAMs. Uh, on the bottom, you can see the EOS chips in IBM 45 SOI. Those were intended to investigate integrated silicon photonics. And in terms of current and future work, we are moving towards the standard RISC-V vector extension. This involves basically replacing the front end, while and we can still retain the lane data path and other control signals. Um, we also intend to investigate uh, polymorphic instructions for the RISC-V vector extension and explore other domain-specific extensions. A draft of the latest RISC-V vector spec is available on GitHub at this link. Uh, now, we're pleased to announce that Huacha is now fully open sourced. This includes, of course, the Chisel 3 RTL. There are parameters that you can play with, including the number of lanes, sequencer slots, or queue deaths. Um, in terms of software, there's an ISA assembly test suite, as well as a hand-coded micro benchmark suite. In terms of uh, verification, we also have a random torture test generator that generates random instruction sequences. And there's a spike extension for simple software simulation and we also provide FireSim support for mapping the design onto a AWS F1 FPGA that runs at 90 megahertz. The tool train consists of a GNU Binus assembler as well as a preliminary OpenCL compiler based on LLVM Apocal. Now there's some documentation in the technical reports that we published over the years. Uh, finally, lots of people have worked on this project, but of course it's thanks to Jens of Lee that the project got off the ground at the beginning. And of course, a lot of other students at Berkeley were involved in the chip development efforts. And here are some of the links to the open source materials. Thank you.